Cool. Cool. All right, let's get started. So current is just moving charge. Nothing more, nothing less. And mathematically, current is defined to be the time derivative of charge. So you can think of current as being the charge per unit time passing a given point. In practice, it's usually the negatively charged electrons that are doing the moving in the circuit. But we like to think of it the opposite as if we like to pretend the positive charges are doing the moving. That way we can say current is the flow of positive charge. That was a result of Benjamin Franklin and his unfortunate guess when he showed when he thought that the charge carriers were positive, but we just stuck with that convention. Current is measured in amperes, which is just how many coulombs per second. And at any point in this presentation, let me know if I'm going too fast, too slow, if I need to speak up or anything like that. Let's just work some examples then. So suppose we have a current at some point in a wire given by the plot below. It starts at two and then it kind of oscillates like a sine wave, a negative sine wave. And we're told that the period of oscillation is 3.6 seconds. How much time passes through that point in the wire from 3.14 seconds to 6.74? Okay. Well, we have a function for the current or we can figure out what the function for the current is. And we know that current is defined to be the time derivative of the charge. This implies that a differential amount of charge is just I times dt. And as always, if we have some differential amount of something, in this case, differential amount of charge, we can find the total charge by integrating. We just need to figure out what this I is. So we know that the given current assumes the form of a negative sine wave with amplitude it looks like it's going up to 2.4 when it starts at 2, so two, 0 0.4 for its amplitude. And we know that we have the relationship, this equation is on the equation sheet, omega equals 2 pi f, where the frequency is just however many times the wave passes through a given point, which is 1 over the period t. The argument of any sine function is omega t, and as such, we can construct the current function, i as a function of t, as the amplitude, and then it's the sine function, omega, which is 2 pi over the period length, times time. And then we have to include the 2 amps DC offset. That's because this graph starts at 2 right here. It doesn't start at the origin as most sine waves do. It starts shifted up. But that's actually an interesting teaching point because our problem changes a little bit if we didn't have that DC offset. If our sine wave, if our current function started at the origin, then we would just have a regular AC signal. And we know that integrating an AC signal, integrating any sine function over a full period, this is a full period because if we take 3.14 and add a period of 3.6, we get 6.74. If not for that DC offset, then we wouldn't be, we wouldn't, whoops. It went away. Hold on. I think Nick's computer just had a brain fart. Like his entire screen just went white. <laughs> uh, so hold on for a second. In the meantime, are there any questions about what was initially just said then, or uh, anything that we can use to fill the time? I have a question um, about the minus 0.4. What was that from? If I could pull up the slide, that was like right in front, right? Oh, give me one sec. Yeah, it was. Is that now showing up again? Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. That's me not knowing now how to use computers. Um. So that 0.04, I believe, is the uh, amplitude uh, as it's coming up from point or from two to 2.4, and so that's what we have out front there. And so if you just took the difference in between the top point along that curve and the middle at which we're starting to, you can see that. 
Um, why is it negative? Because it's an inverted sine function. So usually sine, like if it were normal, it'd start at two and then go up and then down. But this one is really weird and then it goes down first. So it has a negative amplitude technically. Okay. So like the it being a negative amplitude, did that like the normal form of this? Not area? usually. Usually it would be positive. If this, oh, I don't have my cursor, but if the, like that first um, kind of bottoming out or at the top, like if this whole, function were flipped upside down that's kind of more normal and then then your uh, amplitude would be positive 0.4 yeah thanks, if Nick. you think <laughs> about it if you think about it how you normally would see what is it the unit circle you'll initially go from zero to pi correct and that'll be positive values in the y component mm -hmm. and so that's why you typically see it normally going upwards but to account for the fact that we're not going in the general direction off of zero moving across the x-axis that's why we're putting the negative out front okay Cool, cool. Does anyone else have any other questions at this point? Oh, someone's asking if they have access to these slides. Do you want to post them or? I'm emailing Pat right now or in a couple hours to ask if I can, because I don't know if I'm allowed to distribute this stuff, but it, I'd, I'd, I'd like to get them to you. OK, so that's a solid maybe. At, at the <laughs> least we'll have the recording, um, so that's always something that we can reference, right? All right, and someone else just asked what the rest of the expression means. This expression here. Where um, will the recording yes. be? Who knows? Probably um, Tyler sent it out through an email last time. Um, so we might do that or. Um, I don't really know how else you would get it out. I, we'll probably end up emailing it to y'all, but if it comes like anywhere else, then we can just send out an announcement and um, tell you where it ends up. Right on, let's keep going. So again, if we didn't have this two amps DC offset, then our sine wave would start at the origin and it would be just a regular D AC signal with no DC offset. And we know that integrating any AC signal over a full period results in zero. That's why technically speaking, there's no net current in uh, an AC signal just because there's equal amounts of positive and negative if this signal was centered at the origin. But because it's not, we do end up getting some charge. And all that is, is this integral expression that we already derived. We, knew, we know that Q is the integral of dQ and dQ from the definition of current is I dt. We have an expression for I, it's this negative sine function, 2 pi over the period for omega and then plus 2. And we know that if we have integrals, we can split them up wherever we have addition. So we can just split the, the integral into integrating over that same time interval, integrating just the two amps, and then integrating the sine function by itself. But we just argued that any sine function integrated over a full period goes to zero because we have equal amounts of area above and below the x-axis. This is without the DC offset. All that's left then from the contribution is two, this factor out in front, times the period length, which is 6.74 minus 3.14, the 3.6 period. That tells us that 7.2 coulombs of charge transverses that point in that time interval. Any questions about that problem? So some people have been asking whether this can be on the exam. The answer is yeah. Um, we don't write the exams, but the reason we're going over this is because it's a possible question on your exam, and it also uses a lot of concepts throughout this, so it's kind of a good problem to review to make sure you understand like all the different pieces. Cool. Let's move on to the next topic if there's no questions. Someone okay. else just asked. Um, we're not planning on going over the most missed problems from exam one. We're going to run through these slides and then however much time is left, we can answer questions like last time. And if y'all want us to go over that and time allows, we can. But that's not currently on the agenda. Cool. So moving on then. So resistance is just a way of quantifying how much effort it takes to move charge across less than perfect conductors. And experimentally, 
we find that for most materials, resistance is this little row times L over A. In that row, it's not the charge density that we're used to from block one. It's the electrical resistivity, and it's measured in ohm meters. L is the length of the resistor, and A is the cross-sectional area. If rho is constant and A is constant, then the resistance can just be calculated with this left formula. But if either rho or A is non-uniform across the length of the resistor, we need to integrate with respect to the length. Let's do such an example. So suppose we have a wire with a square cross section and suppose that square cross section has a side length of 0.8 centimeters and is lying on the Y axis from Y equals zero to 0.5 meters. And the wire is made of such a material such that its resistivity is a function of Y for Y squared ohm meters for Y measured in meters. What is the resistance of the wire? OK, well, we know that resistivity is not constant. It depends on Y. So we're going to have to use the differential form of the equation, which is on our equation sheet. And we know that the cross-sectional area is a square. So the area is just the side length. The, the cross-sectional area that the current sees is just the side length squared. So then the resistivity is given as a function of y, and the wire lies along the y-axis. So dl is equal to dy. So the A that appears in this equation always refers to the perpendicular cross section. So in whatever direction the current is flowing, in this case, if I draw here, we have sort of a square resistor along the Y axis. Maybe it has leads connected to the front and back. So as current flows along the square resistor, it sees a cross sectional area that's just a square. That's always the area we want to account for. There was the homework problem a while ago where we had the resistance between cylinders and we had two concentric cylinders. And we had leads hooked up like this with a battery. In this case, or in this problem rather, resistivity was constant, rho was constant. But the reason why we had to do an integral was because A was not constant. Because the wires were hooked up such that the current was flowing from the inner shell of the cylinder to the outer shell, sort of along these cylindrical shells, not across the front and back of the resistor. And as such, the area depended on where the current was. The area of the cylindrical shells was 2 pi r l. Yeah, surface area of a cylinder. That's why we had to integrate in that problem. So even though rho was constant, the area wasn't. Also, everyone should be really impressed by the fact that Nick just drew that with the mouse on his computer, because <laughs> I'm really impressed by that. But does that make sense to everyone? Because that's somewhere, I could feel like that's definitely going to be on the exam at some point in time. It's like the silence is a yeah. Right on. All right, let's put it together the integral. We have R is the integral of dr. This concept comes up again and again in FIS2. If we want to find some total quantity, we just integrate the differential of that quantity. Here's our equation. We have rho d, dl, but in this case it's dy because the wire is along the y-axis over a. The resistivity was 4y squared. dy is, or dl rather, is just dy. And the cross-sectional area is just the side length. It was given in centimeters, 0 0.8 centimeters. So if I'm keeping everything in meters because the bounds are in meters and every and Y is measured in meters here, then I have this factor of 10 to negative two. Four and the area are constants, so they come out of the integral and the rest is. Easy enough to compute the the main. Uh, idea behind that problem was how to set it up. Nick, can you scroll back up to the top so that they can see like the original question real quick? Yeah, so if you guys want to screenshot that or something really quick, but um, if at the end of the slides you guys still have a question about this, we can run through another example problem.
All right, so um, we're going to start moving into resistors and a few other portions of circuits. Um, as of right now, do we have any questions about what we just went over? Uh, I'm sorry, but the bounds for uh, that problem that on the screen right now, that would just be zero to 0.5 meters, right? For the bounds. Yeah. Right, because you're integrating with respect to y, that's what's changing your resistivity. So you have a dy in your equation, so therefore your bounds would be with respect to y. Yeah, and like Nick was saying, uh, the cross-sectional area that it's seen is where we're using that 0.8 centimeters. And the length that that, that current is traveling is where we're getting those bounds from, or is really how we're applying those bounds. And that's why, like as he just said, we're looking at the length that travels along the y-axis so that we can plug that in and determine it with our differential that is, again, with respect to y. Okay. Um, so next thing that's going to come up is we're going to do a little review of how we apply certain things to resistors that are in series, parallel, and same kind of thing for Kirchhoff moving forward, okay? So for resistors, whenever they are in series, if you don't mind scrolling down on the uh, original page, Um, so here, essentially the thing to remember is that whenever we do have series that are in, or sorry, excuse me, resistors that are in series, um, what's going to be the same for them is the amount of current that's flowing through them. And we can find the total amount of resistance for a system of those particular resistors that are in series by just the sum of them, right? Whereas in opposition, if they were in parallel, uh, we could say then that the voltage drop would be the same. However, to find the total amount of resistance for a system that is in parallel, we have to do the reciprocal sum and solve for it that way. I know that this is something that uh, everyone should be familiar with by now, but do we have any questions about why this is or any kind of questions about why the voltage drop might be the same or why the current going through series might be the same? Uh, why is the voltage drop the same? So I'm going to let Nick take this. He uh, He's very eager to get back into it, so I'm going to let him go for it. Nick, you're definitely muted. <laughs> I can't hear you. Yeah. All right, so I think Nick's <laughs> going to do some drawing here to help relay the idea of gonna, why voltage drop should be the same. We're going to interpret the drawings. Someone says move your mic thing. I don't know what that means, but. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so one of the key things uh, before Nick goes into his explanation that I'd like to really hit on is that if you kind of think about it, in somewhat of a logical sense as we're going through this, the amount of current that's going to be going to each of the resistors that are in parallel will be dependent on the amount of resistance that that current's going to be seen going towards that resistor. So if we're thinking about this in the simplest setup possible, right? Let's say that we have current that's going and splitting into two different resistors. If I were to have one that has twice the amount of resistance on one side as opposed to the other, so let's, for simplicity's sake, say, two ohms versus one ohm, which one would you expect to have more current going through it? And about how much more would you expect? OK, I'll take over from here if that's fine with everyone. OK, so. Picking up where Kate left off. Ohm's law asserts that voltage drop or voltage will drop only if there is a non-zero resistance. So if we have some current and some non-zero resistance, then there will be a voltage drop across said component. In our model that we use, wires are perfect conductors. They don't have any resistance. As such, it must be the case that everything here along this wire 
is at one voltage and it stays at one voltage because it's just the same wire. And then there's some voltage drop across this resistor and across this resistor. But again, they reconnect into wires back here. So then this orange piece is at the same potential. It's at the same voltage. And this works no matter how many resistors we have. So if I had another resistor that was splitting off here, and then another one. Just because these are still connected by wires, the voltage here is the same no matter what. And same thing here. It's a different voltage now, but the voltage at the bottom of those wires is the same. That being the case, the difference in voltage across any one of these resistors is just the difference in voltage between the yellow voltage, let's call it VA, and then the orange voltage, VB. That's the same no matter which resistor you go across. That's why it's the same in in uh, parallel. Also, this doesn't just apply to resistors. It also applies to capacitors. So it's like everything stuff in parallel has to have the same voltage drop. Stuff in series has to have the same current and that applies to just circuits in general. So if you ever stuck on a problem, try and thinking back to like those two fundamental things and you can try and like piece your way out of it. And I think that that helps a lot. Any other questions with that? Uh, I just wanted to confirm. So you guys said if a resistance is in series, then it will have the same current throughout all the resistors. And then if the resistors are in parallel, it will have the same voltage. Correct. OK, that's Thank that's you. not only true for just resistors, but anything in series must necessarily have the same current because current is the flow of charge. And if charge only has one path to go as it does along stuff in series, then it must necessarily have the same current. Conversely, if we have stuff in parallel, like we already argued, we know that the voltages along wires has to be the same. Wires are what's known as equipotentials. So the voltage along this yellow wire is the same and along this orange wire is all the same. So the voltage drop is just the yellow voltage minus the orange voltage, and that's the same no matter which resistor in parallel you go down. But again, that's not only for resistors, that's true for capacitors and everything else. Awesome, thank you. Of course. All right, let's move on to the next concept. So it takes effort to move charges across a resistor and the energy change by some charge moving from point A to point B is this familiar formula from block one, delta U equals Q delta V. We know that power is defined to be the rate of energy change. It's the derivative of energy with respect to time. So if we take the time derivative of this equation, we can derive the expression for the power drop across any circuit component. Taking the time derivative of both sides, we have du dt. Q can be assumed to change with respect to time, but delta V, that's going to be constant, so that just comes out of the derivative. We're left with dq dt but we know that dq dt is current. So we find that power is I times delta V. In particular for ohmic materials, those are materials that don't, it, the current going through them does not change depending on the voltage drop or vice versa, where Ohm's law applies essentially. The, resist, the current and voltage are constant no matter, or sorry, the resistance is constant no matter the voltage or the current. We can sub in Ohm's law and say that instead of V, we have V is equal to IR, so we get power is equal to I squared R or delta V squared over R. I'm going to interject. So this right here, what Nick did, is something that's really helpful throughout like kind of any problem in this unit and where if they're asking you to solve for power or something like that, you can plug in for Ohm's law for like anything that you need and manipulate it. So like, I don't know, say they gave you a problem where you didn't have current, but you had resistance. You can plug in for current, get rid of it and use like that form at the end. And so um, the only form that's on your equation sheet is the P is equal to IV, but don't forget that you can like manipulate that if you need to. Super, thank you. If there's no more questions, then let's go to Shirkov's current law. 
this states that the sum of the currents entering a junction is equal to the sum of the currents leaving a junction. And this is a statement of charge conservation. Because it must be the case. Well, if current is related to charge just by a time derivative. If it was the case that the current going into a junction was different than the current going out. Physically, that's sort of like if we had charges piling up at one of the junctions and that would imply that charges are just being generated or destroyed at a junction, which cannot be the case. As such, we get that for any junction, whatever current goes into it has to be coming out of it. This is also known as the junction equation. Did say Kirchhoff again? Shirkoff. OK, I've been saying that wrong this entire time. Sick. <laughs> cool. And then Shirkoff's voltage law states that the sum of the voltage drop around a closed loop is zero. Uh, let's zoom out a bit so they can see a bit more. Josh, is this a slide you're talking about or the next one? This one. OK, cool. Good. I think cool, cool, cool. Let's move on to Shearcroft's voltage law, which states that the sum of the voltage drops around a closed loop is zero. This, unlike Shearcroft's current law, is a statement of charge conservation because we know that delta V is equal to, or rather, delta U is equal to Q delta V. So if voltage is the amount of energy per unit charge, then having the voltage drops be zero around a closed loop insinuates that there can't be any energy changed or the energy must be conserved no matter how we go across the loop. So for any closed loop, we can't have any difference in energy. If we start at one point with one energy and we make a full circle to that same point, the voltage drops have to be zero. Thinking of Shirkov's voltage law as a statement of charge conservation, or sorry, as a statement of energy conservation, always helps me remember the sign conventions. By convention in phys two, we go clockwise around a loop. So whenever we're creating the junction equations or the loop equations, we just choose any point on the loop, go clockwise, and then consider each circuit element and decide whether there's a positive or a negative contribution to delta V. We know that resistors dissipate energy in a circuit. They dissipate it in the form of heat. So crossing a resistor in the direction of positive current flow, in the same direction of current, if you will. That's a negative contribution to delta V, just because resistors, they take away energy. And crossing a battery or a capacitor from the negative terminal to the positive terminal is the opposite. That's a positive contribution to delta V because energy is being supplied by the battery. Mm. And now we have an equation that, or a worked example that Izzy wanted to take. Okay, so whenever it comes to Kirchhoff stuff like that, it doesn't really matter exactly where you start, as long as kind of where you start is where you end up. So for example, let's look at kind of like the uh, outer bigger loop on here. So let's say I'm starting at the bottom. If I'm going and like Nick said, go clockwise, um, if you decide to go counterclockwise, that's fine too. It's just that your final equation, you're going to get all of your signs to be flipped. So the way that you'll know if you're right or not is whether all your signs are the exact same or all your signs are opposite. But just for ease, I think it's better to go clockwise. But if I'm going across this resistor with the current, the job of the resistor is to drop the voltage, right? So it's going to give you like a negative value. And then I'm moving around this outer loop, right? And your I1 is coming down, but you're going up. And so because you're going against the current for that, you're going to get a positive V value, right? And then I probably should have mentioned also that because of like Ohm's law. Oh, yeah, give me one sec.
We can't hear you. Sick, thank you. All right, all I was just talking about how bad my arrow was, but <laughs> um, if I'm going with my current across this resistor, the job of the resistor is to drop your voltage, right? So you're going to get a negative I3 R4 for this one. And then I'm coming up this side. Oh, that one's even worse. My gosh, I'm coming up this side of the loop, right? So my I1 is going the opposite direction that I'm going. Therefore, you're going against the resistor, so you'd have a positive. Oh gosh, this is actually really hard. <laughs> a positive I1 R2. Stop laughing at me, Nick. Oh man. All right, moving on now. We're on this side of the loop. So once again, you're going against the current. Therefore, your voltage is going to be positive. I'm just going to put a sign here rather than trying to draw all the other stuff out. OK, and then we're coming down here. So like Nick said, if you're going from the negative to a positive end of the battery, you're going to be gaining. But since we're going from positive to negative, that means you're going to be dropping voltage. And also just think about like numbers wise, you're getting more and more negative. So you're going to have a drop. And then your Kirchhoff equation for the big loop would be um, negative I3 R4 plus I1 R2 plus I1 R1 minus V2. So that's the um, determination if we go clockwise. And then if you happen to go counterclockwise, you'd have, you should have all the same like I1 R2 magnitude stuff, but then all your signs would be switched. So in this, there's um, two other loops. So there's like this inner one. Oh my goodness. Don't laugh at me. And then there's this one as well. So you do like the same type of convention. You just kind of go through those smaller ones. But um, does that make sense kind of, of how we got like a Kirchhoff loop equation and all like the signs and stuff and everything? So those equations, what do you equal them to? Those like equal to zero or what? So they should, like Nick talked about before, up here you have to have like conservation, right? And so they should all be equal to zero because you can't have to just kind of like disappearing. Cool. Does anyone else have any other questions? Is there stuff in the chat? Because I'm not looking at it right now. Cool. And then if um, we're going to. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I, just that uh, crossing negative to positive on a voltage source makes a positive. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, so if you're going from positive to negative, you're negative. If you're going from negative to positive, you're going positive. So, so uh, with these questions too, uh, are you supposed to do the big outer loop or are you supposed to just do like the like the two inner loops when you solve so, problems like this? So technically, um, the way that I've seen them on exams at least is it'll just ask you which one of these equations is a valid loop equation. So technically mm -hmm. that could be any of the three. It could be oh. the outer loop or the top or the bottom. Um, they could, I mean, technically I guess you could just ask for like the top loop exactly what that is, but usually um, they ask you like which one of these is valid. So you'd have to like form all the equations on your own. Okay. Oh, the only other thing that I'll say to that is that it kind of depends on how many unknowns you have, how many equations that you'll want to get out of it. So like in the problems that we had earlier in studio, uh, we didn't know a lot of what was it, the currents going through them. So we had to make a system of equations wherever we had um, the same amount of equations as unknowns correct so as we moved forward that's how we were able to solve but if it were something wherever maybe we were only trying to get one current then we wouldn't necessarily have to define each of the loop rules necessarily does that make sense yeah that makes sense okay cool cool, cool. all right does anyone have any other questions uh there's a bunch in the chat I think we can come back to that um, at the end of the presentation. The thing that I'll say is that typically we don't ask you all to solve the system of equations on the test. It's more so just setting them up, but we can definitely go over an example if you'd like at the end. On that same note, usually people don't get their own calculators for uh, this test, but this semester is crazy, so you do get your own calculators. I would invest some time in learning how to solve systems on your calculators just in case because if they do end up asking you to solve for currents most calculators especially texas instruments um they have really nice ways of solving systems and that will save you a lot of time if you just have the equations and you can go straight to the answers yeah and like um kate said 
it's typically um, on exams, it's kind of more so like which one of these is a valid loop equation, but Nick's definitely right. Um, if you're worried about it, then maybe spend some time looking into it. I would say the chances of it being on there, like them asking you to solve like this huge algebraic equation isn't great just because we're trying to test your physics knowledge, not your algebra. But um, that being said, we don't make the exams, Pat does, so there's a chance it could actually be on there. And then just a few other things that are still in the chat. There was a question that pertained to why I3 is flowing in the direction that it is. Um, and really the conventions that we have right here are just going to be our initial guesses for where the currents are, right? And so we might get a negative value or a positive value for each of these currents. And really what it's telling us is if we get a negative value for that current, that the direction we've indicated on this system here is the opposite of what it is in reality, right? And that's something that we went through in studio wherever you guys made initial guesses on that system as well. And you were able to see that for some of them you got negatives, some of them you were able to extract positive values out of it. Cool, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, if that doesn't make sense, say something we can try and run through a different way but um are there any more questions in the chat yeah, Nick's, if you're trying to solve this problem, loop of this problem, what you think it three so um someone asked about like the top equation and yeah um, Sorry, I keep interjecting. Um, so one of the ways to kind of identify which of the currents you would want to use is that we can look at our junction um, kind of in between R2 and R3. Thank you, Izzy, for writing on that. Um, and we can kind of extend those currents out to that point, right? And therefore, we can kind of see for each of these which current we will be using. Because in this system and how we've set it up, we will say that current I1 will be going through not only resistor one, but also resistor two down to that junction. Cool. I can also, what I was going to touch on next kind of hits that as well, but talk about the junction rule really fast. And so all that is like Nick says, let me scroll up really quick, is that every the current coming in has to equal the current coming out. So if we look, the easiest thing to do for a junction rule is just on your circuit, draw little like nodes. So like I have drawn poorly right here. Um, but you have I1 coming into it. There we go. Oh, that one's better. All right, I'm not even going to do I2 because it's right there, but you have I3 here as well. Oh, lost it last minute. Um, so you have I1, I2, and I3 all coming into this and coming out. Therefore, your a valid uh, junction equation would be like I1 plus I2 plus I3 equals zero. If for some reason, I don't know, let's say you're... Um, your I3 were going this way, and it was like indicated on your thing, then your loop equation would be I1 plus I2 equals I3, because that's what's coming out. So does that make sense to everyone? Oh man, Nick, you're really good at drawing on here. I just wanna say it's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> so just to reader, reader Mm. Reiterate with the signs. If you go across a battery from its negative terminal to its positive terminal, that's a positive contribution to delta V because it adds energy to the circuit. For batteries, it doesn't matter what direction the current is going. So you're still going clockwise or counterclockwise, but you're still going in one set direction around the loop, usually clockwise. It doesn't matter if you're going in opposition to the current or with the current. The signage on the battery is just a function of whether or not you start at the negative terminal or the positive terminal. For resistors, that's when it matters. If you're going with positive current flow, then resistors are negative contributions to the delta V. If you're going against the flow of positive charge, against the flow of the indicated current arrows, then resistors are positive. by master pace with resistor equals negative <laughs> just because like once again the way that i always think of it is the job of the resistor is to drop your voltage right that's what it has to do so if you're moving with your current along uh or you're moving with the current along a resistor then you're going to go negative but i think that's the end of my kirk off spiel all right you want to switch back 
I hate drawing. <laughs> Can you guys hear me still? OK, cool. Yeah, um, there are two junctions in, in this example. The other junction is just right here, except we don't have an equation for that junction because it's just the same as the other junction. It's still up oh, the wrong way. In this case, it would be all currents are leaving the junction, so we would have 0 is equal to I1 plus I2 plus I3 for this other junction right here. And to determine the number of currents in the junction, each loop or each like segment that emerges from a junction has to have a unique current. And that stems from the fact that current is the same across stuff in series. So this segment is sort of unique in the loop, so it has to have its own current, and that's I1. The segment is by itself, so that's I2. And then we have I3. Well, now you're taking away my, my hard work. That was my best <laughs> arrow. Oh my gosh. OK, any other questions on Shirkov? Kirkov? All right, I don't see any more in the chat, so I think we're okay. good. Yeah, like always, I'll try to go slower, and then I'm more than happy to go back to anything if there's questions at the end. Cool. Capacitors. So this is now getting into topic 2C. Capacitors or capacitance is defined to be the amount of charge Q stored per unit voltage applied. It's just this ratio Q over delta V. And it's measured in farads, where one farad is equal to one coulomb per volt. A capacitor, as opposed to capacitance, is just a device with two electrodes, maybe two pieces of metal, two plates, each storing equal and opposite amounts of charge separated by an insulator, either just a vacuum or often a dielectric. And because a capacitor has two plates, one positive plate and one negative plate, capacitance is always defined to be positive. Capacitance only depends on the geometry of the capacitor and the materials that it's made out of. It never depends on the charge or the delta V. So if the charge on a capacitor's plates is increased, then delta V will in increase correspondingly such that C is held constant. The only way we can change C is by changing the geometry of the capacitor. Cool. So capacitors store energy in the form of electric fields. And for a capacitor with capacitance C and potential difference delta V, the energy stored is one half C times delta V squared. That equation is on your equation sheet. And we can also express this energy in terms of the charge Q. So if we know that capacitance is defined to be Q over delta V, if we solve for delta V, we get that it's Q over C. And we plug this delta V into here, we get capacitance is equal to one half Q squared over C. And I'm sure you guys saw lots of forming problems where it said like, I increase the plate separation distance by this much, by how much does the capacitance change? There's one key strategy in those problems, and that is to figure out what is being held constant. Often, it'll be the case that it'll tell you in the problem that the capacitor is isolated. In that case, charge is being held constant because there's no way for charge to escape off the plates of an isolated capacitor. If charge is being held constant, then you want to use this equation for finding out what happens to capacitance as various things are manipulated because it's in terms of something that's being held constant. If on the other hand, voltage is being held constant and that would occur whenever the capacitor is hooked up to a battery then you want to use this equation for capacitance. And I'm terribly sorry, big mistake. This should totally be a U and not a C. Sorry about that. Any questions about that? 
I'm going to um, reiterate. Oh, go ahead. Uh, where does the one half come from, like, conceptually? Conceptually, that would go all the way back to the field equation for energy in an electric field. And that derivation is non-trivial. I'm happy to come back to it, but I can tell you that you don't have to worry about it because it's on the equation sheet, but I'm more than happy to show you. In fact, I'll write it up right now so that you have it with you. I, I, there's no short answer I can give right now other than that it just pops out of the math in the derivation for the equation stored by an electric field. Cool. So I'm going to reiterate two things really quick. Okay, one is kind of like before when we were talking or when I mentioned how you can plug in for Ohm's law. This is like the exact same situation. So like Nick said, that first equation at the top is what's on your equation sheet, but you can manipulate that into whatever you need. So that's kind of where it's important for those problems that Nick was talking about is to figure out kind of what's held constant and make sure you put that into there because you don't want to have something that's changing in there because that statement is no longer true. And then the other thing I want to talk about is like this is always an exam question, but whenever there's they, um, there's always something asking about capacitance and the only thing that can change the actual capacitance of a capacitor is if you change like the geometry of your capacitor. So like separate the changing the distance between your plates or like adding a dielectric or like um, making the plates of your parallel plate capacitor bigger or something like that or smaller. Those are things that are going to be able to change. So it's geometry. It's not like tripling the voltage or something like that. And do you talk about the parallel plate capacitor equation at all? I don't think I did, but it's also okay. on your equation sheet. It's yeah. uh, C. Let's see if I can do this. I'm going to also mention something real quick. So this is the equation that you guys have been using a lot. It's on your equation sheet at the bottom, but what you really, really need to know about this is that this is very specific to a parallel plate capacitor and a parallel plate capacitor only. If you're given like a cylindrical capacitor or spherical capacitor or something like that, do not use this equation. You have to derive it from like Gauss's law, which we'll talk about later, you've done in studio, but like that's something that's really important. And also like whenever you have questions like this where they're asking about changing random stuff and it's on a parallel plate capacitor, this is usually where you want to go. And the other thing I really want to emphasize is the fact that this A in this equation is referring to the like surface area of your capacitor plates and the D is referring to the distance between the two plates. So that's why like I remember there's a studio problem where they have like uh, two capacitors that are in series and then they're in parallel and what they're testing you on is whether you know the difference between the D and the A because if I have two capacitors in series like one on top of the other then your D becomes D over two, right? Because it's the distance between the two plates. But let's say I have the two capacitors next to each other, then your A is A over two because the surface area of your capacitor plate is split in half. And um, if that doesn't make any sense, we can go over like those two problems from, I think they're from studio, maybe they were homework, but um, it's really important to know like what those two variables pertain to. So does that make sense to everyone? Uh, yeah, so then that, Equation that he wrote with the C is that uh, is there a K in there too for like when the dielectric is added? Yes. Oh, so anytime okay. that you have a dielectric, you'll just multiply epsilon naught times that dielectric constant K, um, and so that's how you'll change from the initial capacitance just provided in this equation here to anything with a dielectric. You'll just be multiplying epsilon naught times that K. Okay. But the way that it's written is the way that's on your equation sheet. So just keep that in mind that like whenever you have a dielectric, um, you can put it wherever you want. I think it's always easier to just like Kate said, tack it on next to the epsilon knot. But it's just implied that for a regular capacitor, your K is one, which is why it's not on there. OK, um, at this point, there's a few things that are in the chat that I think we should address. Um, so for the top versus bottom equations, which should we use whenever voltage is constant? Um, for the top one, I would say that's whenever we have voltage being constant, but if we were to change something about a capacitor, let's say we change how far they are in their separation or any other kind of parameter about that, then I would say that is a time that we can move down to the secondary equation where we have it in terms of Q over capacitance or Q squared over capacitance. Um, a few other things. Um, I'm not necessarily sure what this is referring to whenever it says I didn't quite catch that. Um, can we get something in the chat that 
hopefully you can detail that a little bit more. And then so A divided by two for parallel. Um, I believe that's referring to a question earlier on in studios wherever it was two side by side. And so if they provide you the area of two capacitors side by side, the reason that it was area divided by two is because the total amount of area was provided to you, but it has two different dielectrics being split down the middle. Um, yeah, the so parallel in series. OK, yeah, so mm -hmm. it might be good to uh, get a drawing of that as yeah. well um, so that we can kind of discuss it a little bit more. Just to reiterate on the first question that Kate answered, we use this equation when voltage is being held constant and voltage is held constant whenever we say, for instance, we have a battery here and it's hooked up to the capacitor. Well, these two things are in, or in parallel and we know that stuff in parallel has the same voltage, so voltage is held constant in that case. If we had an isolated capacitor, like if we had a capacitor that we disconnected from the battery and it was just floating out in space, then charge is being held constant because there's no way for the charge on the plates of this capacitor to jump off. Cool. And then um, Paris, what you're asking about, so I can go back through it really quick, but just conceptually that A, because it's the area of the actual plates of the capacitor, if these were in parallel, so Nick, you want to draw a line between those two real quick? Oh, I'm moving, okay. All right, quick introduction. Okay, so if I were um, to put, I don't know, let's say this is like K1 and K2. So the whole point with these is that, like I said before, it's kind of like it really important to understand like where your variables mean that we don't have to memorize anything and you can kind of just like logically think through it. This A right here is the area of the plates of your capacitors, like the surface area. Therefore, if I have these connected in parallel like they are here, really this is divided in half as well, right? So it's all going to go through this side or this side. But if I have, give me a sec to erase all this stuff that I just drew. But if I have two capacitors in series, oh, that probably should be a lot straighter. And so this is like one and this is two. This D in the bottom of this equation stands for the distance between the plates. So if I have a capacitor, another one like right here in the middle, or you have two different dielectrics, your A stays the same, right? You still have the entire surface area of your um, capacitor plate, but now the distance that is traveling is half. It's not from this one to this one. It's only going through half of it. So this D is over two. Does that make sense to everyone? So uh, what exactly were you doing when you when you said like the A, uh, telling about the A changes when you put them in parallel, were you connecting a wire between the two uh, plates? Um, it's more of like my really bad artist condition, but it's just like if you had, you have like your one capacitor, but you have two different dielectrics like right next to each other, and then you can treat it as if they're in parallel. Does that answer your question? So this is all about, about how dielectrics would change the equation? Yeah. Okay. So you, What's the difference between a a dielectric in parallel versus a dielectric in series? It's the way that uh, it affects the capacitance. And also, like, if they were asking you, I don't know, like an energy equation, kind of like what Nick was talking about before, it's like, okay, I double the plate area and I have, or like I tripled the distance between them. How is, like, the area affected? So this is something where you can use, um, like, C is equal to A epsilon naught over D because it's a parallel plate capacitor, and you're not going to have any dielectrics in that situation, but it's just, like, understanding what those variables are helps you manipulate that equation, and I just happen to, like, use dielectrics for this example, but um, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. It's just kind of just understanding what each one means. Does that make sense? Oh man, I gotta be honest, it doesn't quite, but you can move on for now. No, we're good. If you want, we can, um, there's like, this is, I'm referring to like a specific problem we did in studio, so I can like run back through it after, but um, yeah, we can always nice. come back to it. Okay, cool. OK, can I get a, a vibe check, so to speak? How are we doing on this? 
Thumbs up, thumbs down. That means send cool gifts in the chat. Cool. Oh, we got a yeah with a lot of H's. I think that's good. Oh, we got a pretty good. <laughs> Solid vibe check. Nice, Nick. <laughs> okay. Um, let's keep going then. Yeah. All right. Cool. So capacitors in series. This is the opposite of resistors in series. Capacitors in series store the same charge because they have the same charging current, and we know that anything in series has the same current. So for n capacitors in series, their equivalent capacitance is one over or one over their equivalent capacitance is one over C1 plus one over C2 all the way up to the end. And moreover, not only do capacitors in series store the same charge, but any number of capacitors in series, let's say we have a capacitor here. And then we have another capacitor in series here. And then a third one here. And then let me get a red thing right here. So let's say that capacitor has a positive charge. And same here and same here. Give me a second to draw this all the way out. OK, not only do we know that all these capacitors by themselves store the same charge, so the charge on C1 is the same as the charge on C2, which is the same as the charge on C3, but the whole entire system of capacitors stores the same charge as any one of them. And the way I like to think about that is because you have this negative plate of this capacitor that cancels with this positive plate of that capacitor. And again, this negative plate cancels with that positive plate. What we're left with is just a positive plate essentially and a negative plate. So the charge on the whole capacitor system is just the charge on any one of them, which we can find by first finding their equivalent capacitance. How's that sound? Yeah, again, feel free to speak up if you have any questions. Shout out to Mateo, the only one that sent a GIF. Cool. For capacitors in parallel, they are subject to the same voltage drop. So again, sort of harking back to how we said anything in parallel has the same voltage drop. If we have any number of capacitors in parallel, the voltage drop across those capacitors has to be the same. And their equivalent capacitance is easy enough to calculate. It's just C1 plus C2 plus however many capacitors there are. Cool. Dielectrics, if we're ready to move on. If there's no other questions. Cool, nothing in, nothing in chat. Uh, okay. uh, I have a, I have a nope. question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so for uh, capacitors in series, yeah. Um, the way they showed it to us was that it was going to be one over C one plus one over C two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh -huh. All of that quantity times to the negative one. Uh -huh. Is that still the case, or is it just going to be one over C one plus one over C two plus one over C three? No, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Because if we take both sides of this equation and raise it to the negative first power, one over C one, or sorry, one over C equivalent to the negative first power is just undoing the reciprocation. So we have C equivalent is equal to than what you said, one over C1 plus one over C2, all the way on, and then all that quantity to the negative first power. All right, great, thank you so much. Yeah. Great questions. Okay. Okay, for dielectrics. Sometimes the space between a capacitor's electrodes is filled with some insulating material, other as opposed to just having a vacuum there. And such materials are called dielectrics, and their purpose is to increase the capacitance of the capacitor. Dielectrics, they have a dielectric constant, which we usually call kappa. As Pat likes to say, that's usually a misnomer because it's rarely all that constant, but sometimes it is. And now let's go into the mechanics of how dielectrics increase capacitance. So if we have a capacitor, and it has a negative plate with some negative charge right here. And then it has a positive plate with some positive charge on the bottom. There's going to be an electric field established by that capacitor. 
And we know that electric fields point from positive charges up to the negative charges. So that black electric field, that represents the electric field of the capacitor. Then if I stick some dielectric molecules in there, that electric field is going to cause those molecules to get lined up. In fact, we're going to have the positive ends of those polar molecules facing the negative side of the capacitor plate, and we're going to have the negative ends of the polar molecules to attracted to the bottom positive plate of the capacitor. What that does for us, again, electric fields point from positive charges to negative charges. If we have a net concentration of positive charges from the dielectric here and a net concentration of negative charges here, what happens is that the dielectric sets up its own electric field that acts in opposition to the electric field of the capacitor, thereby weakening the electric field in the capacitor. OK, well, what are the consequences of that? If the dielectric sets up its own electric field that weakens the electric field in the capacitor, well, we know that the voltage difference in a capacitor is found, or voltage difference in general, is found by integrating the E field. And in general, for capacitors, we can assume that the electric field is constant. So this electric field comes out of the integral, and we're left with DL from the bottom plate to the top plate, which just amounts to the electric field times the plate separation distance for that integral. So if the electric field is getting weaker and the plate separation distance is staying the same, then the voltage difference is getting correspondingly weaker as well. But let's remember the definition of capacitance. Delta V is getting smaller. Q didn't change because I never actually took any charge off the plates of the capacitor. So if the denominator is getting smaller and the numerator is staying the same, then C has to increase with the addition of a dielectric. Any questions about that? Um, I got kind of lost in the uh, electric field thing. Is that electric field equation for the dielectric electric field or for the capacitor? Uh, what I did right here? Yeah. This is just whatever electric field is in between those, uh, those plates. So I'm trying to find the voltage difference between the the red plate, the positive plate, and the blue negative plate, which means I integrate whatever electric field exists inside that uh, equation. And that electric field, without a dielectric, it would just be this black electric field of the capacitor. But since I included a dielectric that creates its, this green electric field that acts in opposition to my capacitor electric field, this E gets smaller. Thank you. Of course. There's no way I'm that good of a teacher that no one has any questions. Please don't hesitate to speak up if something does make sense. Could you give an example um, based on that diagram you have up above about how we would actually go about finding delta V via, through the integral? Of course. Yeah, great question. So. We have on our equation sheet the electric field of an infinite sheet. Let's not do it in green so it's not confusing us with the dielectric. We know that the electric field of an infinite sheet of charge, purple, is given on our equation sheet. This can be derived with Gauss's law as sigma over epsilon, sigma over two epsilon naught for the electric field of an infinite sheet. A capacitor can be sort of modeled as two infinite sheets. So if I just multiply this equation by two, the electric field of a capacitor is sigma, which is the charge density or the surface charge density, Q over the area of the plates divided by epsilon naught. Cool. So that's the E field of the capacitor. And if I want to integrate to find the voltage of the capacitor, I would just integrate this expression. So then the delta V for a parallel plate capacitor would be the integral of, we said Q over epsilon naught A, and then I'm integrating 
across the length of the capacitor. So let's say from zero to the plate separation distance D. That gives me Q times D over epsilon naught A. Would our epsilon not be multiplied by um, some constant K? Absolutely. If Yeah, I did this for just the electric field of the capacitor by itself, but if we had the dielectric constant in there, it's no longer the case that our electric field is this. We, know, we would now have the cap in there. OK, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What else? OK, while I'm at this, let's derive the equation for a pl parallel plate capacitor. So. Uh, let, yeah, so we know that capacitance is given by Q over delta V. And we just calculated what delta V has to be for a parallel plate capacitor. It's this. So if I substitute that into this equation, the Q's will cancel. Epsilon not A will jump to the top. D goes to the bottom and I recover the equation that's on our equation sheet for a parallel plate capacitor. Super. All right. Now let's go to Gauss's law and dielectrics. So with dielectrics, we make one substitution in Gauss's law, and that is instead of epsilon not in the denominator of the right-hand side, we replace it with epsilon, and epsilon is just whatever the dielectric constant, kappa is times epsilon not. So Gauss's law becomes this. Cool. Let's do an example of that. Also, this is kind of the method you want to go through if you have a problem where you don't have a parallel plate capacitor. So if they give you some sort of like cylindrical or spherical capacitor, this is where you want to go because like I said before, that equation that's on your equation sheet that Nick just derived is only for parallel plate capacitors. Right on. OK. So suppose we have a spherical shell of radius A. Let's do it in teal. A spherical shell of radius A. That's its radius, and then it's nested within a larger shell of radius B, and it's going to be brown. Sorry about the bad pictures, but there's the radius B. And the space between them is filled with a dielectric with dielectric constant kappa. So let's make a gray dielectric constant or a gray dielectric. Cool, and I want to find the capacitance of this arrangement. OK. We can start by assuming a charge of plus Q on the inner electrode. So we have plus Q here. And then we have minus Q on the, the equal and opposite minus Q on the outer electrode. And that's our jumping off point. The reason why we're allowed to do that is because, again, we're deriving the expression for capacitance. And as we argued a while ago, up here, capacitance does not depend on the amount of charge on its plates. It depends only on the material geometry, which is what we're about to investigate. But the amount of charge is arbitrary, so we can just assume some charge plus Q on the inner electrode and run with that. Cool. So Gauss's law with a dielectric reads the closed surface integral of E dot dA is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon. And we want the electric field in between the electrodes, so in this gray region. The reason why we want the electric field there and not anywhere else is because that's the region where we want to find the potential difference. We want delta V between the inner and outer electrodes. And in order to find delta V, we need to have an electric field that we can integrate. As such, Let's stick a Gaussian surface of radius R such that R is between A and B. This Gaussian surface encloses a charge of plus Q because if my Gaussian surface is this green 
thing here. It's enclosing that inner capacitor of radius A and charge Q. So the right hand side of Gauss's law is already taken care of. Because we know the charge in Q is just the positive charge Q that was on the. The inner electrode. And we know the surface area of that Gaussian sphere is 4 pi r squared. On the bottom we have kappa times epsilon naught, so we get an expression for our electric field by dividing over. All the same, all the pertinent symmetry arguments hold that allow us to move the electric field out of the integral. Cool. We can integrate this electric field to find the magnitude of the potential difference delta V between the electrodes. So delta V, usually there's a negative sign here, but again, I'm ignoring it just because we're looking for the magnitude of the electric field. Oh, sorry, of the potential difference. We have the electric field. Here it is. And we're integrating across a length. But since the Gaussian surface is in here, and I'm trying to find the potential difference going from the center electrode out to this outer electrode, that's moving in the radial direction. So I can say that my DL is equal to just dr. Q, 4 pi, kappa, epsilon naught, those are all constants, so I take them out of the integral. I'm left with the integral from A to B of 1 over R squared, which we can integrate to get that. Any questions so far? Could cool. you just pause there just for a second while I write it down? Sure. So then again, I'm... I'm oh. yeah, give me one second. I'm really hopeful that Pat will say I can email these out. So I'm hoping that these will be able. We'll get these to you. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so I was just going to ask. So like when you take the uh, integral of the E field and mm -hmm. it's always the negative inner field E field, how come uh, before like these topics did, were, were we were we doing the magnitude of the change in voltage? Because I don't remember the negative always canceling out like at the single time we did that. So in general, the negative sign is important. The negative sign, um, it sort of gives the relationship between voltages and electric fields. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's there in the first place has to do with the fact that electric fields point away from positive charges. Sort of by definition, I can show you that if you're curious. But the reason why we ignore it here is because we know capacitance is always defined to be positive anyway. So even if we carry that negative sign out and keep it through the problem, it's not going to matter, matter in the end because capacitance we know has to be positive no matter what. OK, that makes sense. <laughs> Um, so unfortunately, whoever just asked that most recent question, um, it does not appear that your mic is working properly. So if you could type it in the chat, that would be appreciated. Um, there was another question concerning why we're going from A to B instead of A to R. The reason for that is because we're trying to find the potential change in between those two surfaces as we're concerned with the capacitance of this particular the difference in between these two shells, right? And so in order to get the amount of potential change in between those two different shells, we're going from A to B. And the only reason that he drew that Gaussian surface in between is because we're dealing with the space in between the two different radii. And so that's how he's setting up the problem and getting that equation there. Any additional questions on that, Casey? Or does that hopefully help clarify? OK, if that helps. Um, and then I don't know who was. The most recent question, but uh, hopefully we can get that in chat soon. Cool. That also might have been coming from Bikini Bottom because that's where I am right now. All right, so we found Delta V or the magnitude of Delta V rather. And it's with this expression here. So we're almost done. To find the capacitance, we just invoke the definition of capacitance with Q over delta V. Again, the same Q that appears on the numerator of this expression here is the same Q over here that we carried through in our delta V expression. Is the Q that we assumed the 
inner electrode has, which is really reassuring because if we assumed it, then it should be the case that it cancels out and it indeed it does. So I have Q over delta V and I get an expression for my capacitance. Anything, any any questions to wrap that up? So that was for spheres, right? So if it was like asking you for cylinders, the equation would be like a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. for cylinders, which was the other, the, the reason why I did a sphere problem here is because this is something we haven't seen yet in studio, but I think if you go to topic 2C, yeah, you did a problem similar with spheres. The main difference is that, or I guess starting from here, we still assume a charge of plus Q on the inner electrode, but in this case, the inner electrode is just a cylinder. But the area of the Gaussian surface is now 2 pi RL. So when you integrate the electric field, by virtue of having an R in the bottom, you're going to have a natural log in your voltage. That uh, DA for Gauss's law also is like surface area. So whether they throw like some random shapes at you or something like that. If you don't want to memorize them, you can just know that like, that's the surface area. So that's the surface area for a sphere. And then what Nick just talked about is the surface area for a cylinder. Right on. And like we said, exam or topics 2E and 2F are not examinable. So that's all the material that we have to cover with work problems. This you might have seen before. I'll just leave it up on the screen for now. And then, how's it sound if we all take a five minute break to just get ourselves together? Yeah. Um, and then and we can come back for more stuff. Yeah. And in that five minutes, uh, it would be recommended that you guys kind of collect your ideas on what questions you want to ask. I believe that whenever we come back, we'll kind of go directly into those dielectrics in parallel and in series because that was the most recent thing that we kind of wanted to show um, from our discussions here. But yeah, just over the next five minutes, uh, collect your thoughts, maybe get some water and uh, come back with a few questions. All right, guys. Thumbs up in the chat. Um, if you do have a specific problem about a lawn problem, I'm assuming that means a free response, um, then we could definitely probably talk about the uh, free responses that are listed for 2011, 2015, correct? 17, one of the two. Yeah, Izzy just made a good point that um, we don't have any longer problems like that prepared. So if you were to choose one of those prompts to ask us, we'll feel free to go through that with you, uh, but just please be prepared to ask us which one you would rather go over, okay?
All right, please hold. I'm trying to get my iPad to connect so that I can write, but it really is not agreeing with me right now. So give us a sec. All right, so I've transitioned to a new uh, device, so I'm going to draw this rather than like have it from Long Kappa. But if you want to follow along, I'm just doing like um, topic 2D. It's like the studio activities and it's the dielectrics top and bottom. So all the, or I'm sorry, I'm starting with the dielectric side by side, but essentially all it is, it's like this. So this is just your setup for um, your capacitors, right? And it's asking you to find the capacitance of this capacitor. So because it's a parallel plate capacitor, you know your basic equation you're going to want to use is this, right? And as I mentioned before, kind of the most important part of these problems, as well as ones where they ask you about the energy and they're just changing certain aspects, is understanding where these variables come from. So this area is the surface area of the um, plate. So like this right here. And then this D refers to the distance between the two. So if we look at these, um, essentially treating them as two separate piece pieces because they have like different dielectrics, so their capacitance is different, you can treat them as if they're in parallel, right? Because your current's going to either go through the left or the right. And so we know from your equation sheet that you add capacitors in parallel as just like C1 plus C2, right? And um, so then we can go back to like our basic equation, right? So for C1, what we're looking at right here is if the charge is going kind of through um, this like left side right here, it still is traveling that entire distance D. The only difference is that now it's only touching this part of your plate, right? Therefore, your area, the surface area of your parallel plate capacitor is divided by two. So you're going to have... A times K1 times epsilon naught times 2D. And then you're going to do the exact same thing for C2 because once again, you're only looking at like this half of your plate. So you're going to have A times K2 times epsilon over 2D. Cool. So does that make sense to everyone? I'm going to take that as a yeah. OK, cool. All right, so the other situation that can happen, though, is like how these are treated in parallel. Um, I think it's the problem before this one on 2D as well. But you can just have, essentially, you have like this capacitor. And it tells you like this entire material is one thing. And this material is something else. So you have like two different dielectrics. So in this case, once again, if they're asking you to solve for like total capacitance or something like that, you have to go back to your parallel plate capacitor equation. All right, and these capacitors can be treated as if they're in series, right? Because if something goes through K1, it has to go through K2. It's not like an either or option. So capacitors in series are on your equation sheet. They're added like this, right? So if I'm looking at, for example, my C1, we're going to look at your A first, and you still have this entire plate, right? So your surface area isn't affected, so it's just going to be A. What is affected, however, is, oh, I totally forgot to write it, but they tell you that, like, this is D. Therefore, where's that noise coming from? Awesome. How do I turn it off? All right, we're just going to keep going through. So um, 
where was I? Oh yeah. So what is affected in this problem, not the surface area, right? You have the entire surface area of the plate. What is affected is the distance that it's traveling. So for K1, you're only going through this entire portion. So your D would be over two. So you'd have, right? Because your distance is divided by two and your C2 would be the exact same thing. Therefore, if I'm doing my C total, I'm going to erase this real quick. Ah. Oh gosh, hold on. Oh, Cade, I don't know why he has his settings on his iPad like this. Is... All right. So, does that make sense to everyone? Also, too, I think it was like Paris that asked that question. Maybe he's gone, but um, I don't remember exactly what you were asking about. I think you were just talking about like dielectrics and stuff in general, and um, even if you didn't have these dielectrics, I don't know, let's just say they were just like separate capacitors or something like that, you would still kind of treat it the same way. Um, it's the same overall concepts of just understanding that uh, what the A and the D pertain to, but um, like process wise, you kind of go through the problem the same way. So does that clarify? Does anyone else have like any other questions for like these types of problems? Wouldn't it be one divided by that equation? Yeah, so I have like um, this little exponent right here. You can put like the whole thing inverted. I just always put that in my calculator to make it easier. So yeah, it's technically one over all that stuff that I've written. All good. All right, if no one has any other questions, I think, um, do you guys want to run through like a free response or are you going to ask for like specific questions? Okay, someone wants to do the, oh, whoa, okay. Someone wants to do the uh, free response from 2017. Y'all want to do go that? over that. Okay, cool. cool. I'm headed out, so peace. That'd be super. Give me a second to pull it up. Hey, Nicholas, can I ask a quick question? It's just a general question. Go for it. Um, so you, I wasn't here at the very beginnings, but I heard that like one E, uh, two E and two F are not going to be on the exam. Correct. So like we don't have to study those materials at all. Um, yeah, I can pull up the email that Pat said so he has his words. OK. Um, give me a quick second because that'd probably be a good thing to do. Very cool. Um, hold on. Let me. Yeah, can you see my screen right now? This is the email he sent to everyone in the course. And he said that the major problem we have to overcome is that we don't have enough turnaround time to cover to cover topics to E and to F by then. And the homeworks for those topics are due the day of the test, the 13th. Mm -hmm. So exam two will have 16 multiple choice problems and a free response. 12 of those parts will be topics 2A through 2D and the others will be copies from exam one. Oh, okay, sweet. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, 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 of course.
OK, cool. And then we're going over the 2017 exam, right? The free response. Cool, cool, cool. Let's do that. All right, consider the circuit to the right, which has resistors, capacitors, a battery, and a switch. Hold on, give me one quick second. OK. We can apply the RC analysis techniques that we learned to envision this as a simple RC circuit. OK. Yeah. Um, I'll happily go over the free response. Just note that it is. It does look like it's the very first question is material from topic 2E, the RC studios, so I'll we don't go have over. to go over that one then. If that's OK, I thought that it, it could have been okay. because we did yeah. some RC stuff at the very beginning, but never, never mind then we can do 2011 if that I don't know, whatever anyone else wants. Sorry, I suggested that. Um, I'll just kind of interject real quick. Um, one thing that I do think is really important to note is that although it will not be on exam two, uh, that kind of gives more of an indication that it might be present in larger amounts than you might expect on the final. So it's still very good to know. Um, I think that we could do the 2011 um, if you would like to. I do know that there's other um, material out there on it, but we can go over it pretty briefly here if you would like. OK, let's go through 2011 then, if no one's opposed. And not to like, Pat did make the video on the 2011 test, but I think it's good to see it from here a second time. So I think it's it's definitely worth doing. OK, so a commonly used coaxial cable connecting the video components of your home is the RC6. It has an inner copper conductor with radius A and an outer conductor with radius B. You can treat this cable as a cylindrical capacitor and the length of that capacitor, the length of that cable you're using is L. OK. If the inner and outer conductors have charges plus Q and minus Q on them, and if these conductors are separated by styrofoam insulation with dielectric constant kappa, find the electric field expression between the inner and outer uh, uh, conductors. Cool. So this is similar to the problem that we went over during the main review, except here we have cylinders instead of sears. So let's draw our setup. That's sort of what it looks like. We have an inner radius. Do they tell? Yeah, an inner radius of A and an outer radius of B. And they're asking us to find the electric field between them, knowing that there's a styrofoam insulator in between them. OK. Given that there's a dielectric inside that cylindrical capacitor, Gauss's law then reads the closed surface integral of E dot dA is equal to the charge enclosed divided by eps oops, sorry, divided by epsilon, not epsilon, not nope. It's so habitual for me to write epsilon not that I forget to write. Sorry about that. Cool, cool. All right. That's Gauss's law. And then our Gaussian surface, it is inside this cylindrical capacitor. So here it is. It has a radius R where R is between A and B. And again, our Gaussian surface is a cylinder. The amount of charge enclosed by our Gaussian surface is just going to be that total charge that's on the inner uh, electrode of radius A. So the right hand side of Gauss's law is pretty much all taken care of. It's just Q, the charge on the inner radius, divided by epsilon naught times kappa. And as far as the left hand side of Gauss's law goes, all the symmetry arguments to be able to pull Gauss's to pull E out of the integral are satisfied. E is parallel to the DA all along the Gaussian surface, and E is uniform. So we're left with the integral or E pulled out of the integral of dA, and the closed surface integral of dA is just the surface area of that Gaussian surface. Since it's a cylinder, 
the surface area is 2 pi r l. If we divide by that, the electric field is Q over 2 pi. Uh, let's have kappa, epsilon naught, r, and l. Super. That's a good expression for part A. OK, part B. Use the electric field you found in the previous part to find the magnitude of the electric potential difference between the inner and outer conductors. OK. So. What we want to do now is take this electric field expression and integrate from A to B. That will give us the magnitude of the potential difference going from A to B. So we have that delta V or the magnitude of delta V rather. Is the integral of the electric field with respect to some differential length. We have what the electric field is. It's just Q over 2 pi kappa epsilon naught r l. And dl we can just say is dr because we're moving radially outwards from a moving radially outwards to b. And then our bounds of integration are from a to b because we start at the inner electrode and end at the outer electrode. Lots of stuff is constant. We can pull out of the integral. Q comes out, 2 pi comes out, kappa, epsilon naught, and L. We're left with the integral from A to B of dr over r, and that's just the natural log. That's the natural log of B over A. Any questions so far? Oh dear, I did not hear any of that, but if you could, so someone spoke up and then I didn't hear it. So if you could post your question in the chat, I'll be happy to take a look. Why natural log of B instead of natural log of A? Great question. Our bounds of integration were. Um, oh yeah, cool, I can do that. Our bounds of integration were from B to A. So when I take the integral of one over R dr from A to B, I have that the antiderivative is the natural log of R, or technically natural log of the absolute value of R, but not too important. Isn't it the negative integral? It is the negative integral, but yes, as before, we want the magnitude of delta V. So whatever integral we get, we're just going to make it positive. And when we go to do that, we have the natural log of B minus the natural log of A, which using log properties simplifies to B over A. Because B is bigger than A, that ratio is going to be bigger than one. So the natural log of that quantity is going to be positive. And hence, we're going to get a positive value for our answer. Does that answer the question? Right on. Yeah, great questions, guys. Cool. And that's it for part B. We have an expression for the voltage drop going from A to B, or the magnitude of the voltage drop going from A to B of the two electrodes. Part C. Ready to complete algebraic expression for the capacitance of the coaxial cable. Super. All right. Capacitance we know is given by C is equal to Q over delta V. Again, we assumed our charge Q. We don't know what it is, but we just assumed it to be Q. So we'll just leave it there for now. And delta V, that's the expression that we just integrated to get, which if I plug in from here, I have Q over oops I have two pi kappa epsilon naught over L and then all that times the natural log of B over A. Cool. And that's again incredibly reassuring because I assumed what Q was, but I didn't know what Q was, but that's okay because now it cancels out. And I have that my capacitance. Since there's nothing left in the numerator, it just ends up being the reciprocal of what my voltage expression was. 
2 pi kappa epsilon naught L all divided by the natural log of B over A. Any questions on part C? Cool. Part D. In general, you don't want wires to have big capacitances. Straight capacitances can give you a noisy signal. From a design point of view, what can you do to keep the capacitance of the coaxial cable you're using low? Cool. So basically, it's telling us to look at this expression for capacitance and see what can we manipulate such that the capacitance is as small as possible. We have a couple things we can do. If we want to keep capacitance small, we can keep the we can keep the dielectric constant really small, so kappa can be small. Some things that have small dielectric constants, vacuums, vacuum has a dielectric constant of just one because there's no dielectric there. Glass also has really small dielectric constant, I think. Two pi and epsilon naught we can't change; those are just constants of nature. But something else we could do to make the capacitance small is make L small. Again, L is in the numerator, so a small value of L will give us a smaller capacitance. And finally, what we can do to make the capacitance as small as possible is we can make the denominator of our expression to be as large as possible. If we have a large denominator, then our expression is going to be uh, small. So that means that in order to get natural log of B over A as large as possible, the ratio B over A has to be big. So B could be substantially bigger than A, and then the ratio B over A is going to be big. The natural log of a big number is a big number because the natural log is an increasing function. It looks like that. And we'll get a bigger, or sorry, a smaller capacitance. And all this sort of harks back to what we were saying earlier with how capacitance is only a function of material properties and geometry. Again, we could change kappa, which is a property of the material. We could change L or B over A, but those are just the geometry. Those are the dimensions of the capacitor. There's nothing we could have changed about the charge or the voltage it's stored that would have changed the capacitance. Those are constant for what we do. Any questions about that? Cool. We're probably ready to move on to the next topic, so if someone wants to suge suggest something to do. Uh, could we go over a question from the uh, 2017 uh, exam? Sure. Uh, it's called um, a, a Time Dependent Current 2. found it. Cool. Um, let me just make more space here. So a current, I don't know if it's a different question for everyone else, but I'll just read off the numbers that I have. A current given by I of T is equal to one uh, T to the fifth where I is in amps and T is in seconds, passes through as resistor. Suppose the energy dissipated as heat. Oops, that was just bad. Um, the energy dissipated as heat is 8.846 times 10 to the neg 10 to the plus six joules between between t equals three and t equals five seconds or 
What is the resistance? Cool. Yeah, this is a great problem. I like this one. So we're given a current function and we're given the amount of energy dissipated as heat. And somehow we have to relate that to the resistance of the resistor. All right. Well, we know that power. Or rather, we know that power gives us. Or power is given rather by the time derivative of energy. Power is defined to be du dt. As such. The differential amount of energy dissipated over some differential amount of time du is p dt. Hmm. What can we do with that? Well, if we integrate both sides, that tells us that energy, which is the integral of du, which is the integral of p dt, we're given a starting time and an ending time. So that tells us that this problem probably has something to do over a given time interval. And we happen to know how much power is being dissipated over a resistor in that time interval because we have an expression for power no matter what we do. We're given this, we're given a value for energy. So we're given the left hand side of this integral. We just have to figure out some stuff with the right hand side and find a way to extract the resistance from that. All right. Well, we know that power is I times delta V. And we don't know what delta V is, but that's OK because it's dissipated across a resistor. So we can just say that delta V is I R, in which case R power becomes I squared R. And in particular, we have an expression for I. In my case, I is just one times T to the fifth. And I'm squaring that whole entire thing, multiplying by R. That's an expression for my power. If I keep going, one squared is just one. So I have one and then T to the fifth squared is T to the 10th times R. Cool, because now I have an expression for my power that depends on time and resistance. So if I plug this expression into this integral above, I can see that my energy is equal to the, the integral rather of power and power is I squared R. I squared R is one T to the 10th times R DT. And all of that occurred from T equals three seconds to T equals five seconds. Cool. Well, resistance was just constant in this problem, so that comes out of the integral. So we have U is equal to R. The integral from three to five, one times T to the 10th DT. This is an integral we can compute because it's just a polynomial. And in fact, integrating one times t to the 10th gives us t to the 11th over 11. And then we can plug in the bounds. Divide that, or rather divide both sides by the value we get for that integral. And that's going to leave us with r by itself because we have what the left hand side equals. We have what u is. How does that all sound? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Of course. I'm going to hand it off to Kate, who can take the next problem, but keep keep asking questions. Yeah, any other questions from uh, exam review or studio that we want to go over? Can we go over the most missed problems from exam one if there's time? Um, I don't know if we're allowed to because that means sort of disclosing what questions were. Um, yeah, I, I. Out of the safety for us, I don't know if we can. I'd like to, but I don't know. Any other suggestions? Any other things from circuits? Uh, 
Um, how about this? Um, let's spend a little bit of time uh, as we wait for people to come in with uh, some more circuit related things. Do you have specific things that you'd like to go over from exam one or that that unit um, that we can touch on? The one cloud problem. All right, so in that cloud problem, um, I believe um, that the first portion of that is trying to define the sigma or essentially charge density of the Earth, correct? And so very hypothetically, so I'll probably be doing this in a lot of uh, variable forms. We are approximating that the Earth is going to be treated as an infinitely flat sheet here, correct? And so from our equation sheet, we have this nice nifty equation that for an infinite sheet, we have a defined electric field that is, and I believe Nick said this earlier as well, sigma over two epsilon naught, right? And so in this example, we're given some amount, some value for what E is. And generally what this just comes down to is taking our constants of two epsilon naught and solving back for what sigma is. And so I'm just doing this in variable form as of right now. Uh, but in that specific problem, electric field was provided to you. And essentially that's all you had to do in order to get to the sigma that was going to be treated for the Earth. The kind of weird thing about this problem is that we're assuming that it's a flat sheet and that is more specifically something that we get from the problem statement. So I can see how that is a weird thing, um, but really it's how the Earth is curved relative to the cloud at that point. Um, the next portion, so I'll call that part A, the next portion that we went into was evaluating the cloud. And in this part, I believe that we said that we are going to treat the cloud as if it was a perfect circle and that it has some charge density on it. Rho, correct? Sound right? And so actually um, some. OK, so OK, that's a nice thing to say. Um, sigma here because we're treating it as if it was just at the surface, correct? We're saying that the charge was at the surface. Um, so how would we evaluate this if we are trying to get, what was it for this one, the electric field? Any ideas from the chat? Anybody want to speak up? What do you guys think might be the next step in this process? Uh, as <laughs> I'm very sorry, but unfortunately, I think the issue is arising again that uh, we're having trouble understanding um, that particular mic right now. Um, but really what I'm going for right now is Gauss's law, correct? And so once again, we'll just be setting it up so that E dot DA is equivalent to Q over epsilon naught, right? And so we're going to use our symmetry arguments here to say that we're going to have a constant electric field and that we have our DA vector set up in such a way that we can simplify this quite neatly, okay? And so I'm going to rearrange this so that my electric field is equivalent to Q over epsilon naught A, correct? And so we would be able to get what this Q is from what's provided to us in the example, which as Nick so greatly pointed out is Sigma and Sigma has units of coulombs over meters squared, right? So in order to get the amount of area that's present at this particular surface, what equation do you guys think we might use?
we might use the equation Q is equal to uh, A times Rho. OK, so Q is equivalent to A times, and I'm just going to specifically say here that it is a uh, sigma, correct? And so what do we want to plug in for what our A is? So I would say that at this particular surface, we would use the surface area of a sphere, correct? And so what is that? It's four pi r squared. So therefore, in the denominator of our equation, we get sigma multiplied times four pi r squared all over epsilon times another area. What is the area that we might use in the denominator there? Is that like the, is that like a flat area because it's like the ground? Or is that... So keep in mind that whenever we're evaluating Gauss's law, that on this left hand side, this is everything that corresponds to the Gaussian surface, right? Yeah. On the right hand side are the things that are a little bit more tangible. They're the things that where we're getting charged from the actual object. So I don't necessarily remember the setup of this problem right off the top of my head, mm -hmm. but let's say that we have some Gaussian surface that's a little bit farther out, right? Okay. If anyone does have the problem statement pulled up, feel free to correct me if it's not inside or outside, whichever one it is. Um, so we would be using the essentially surface area at that distance, right? Yeah, OK, that makes sense. And so I would generally write that whenever I'm on this left hand side as 4 pi r squared for the area of that, correct? Granted, I would write this as dA, take the integration of it, and it still comes out to be A. Uh, wherever this is actually going to be my variable, most of the time whenever we have a problem like this, the r that is in the numerator is going to be represented as some actual number or something like A that we have represented, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to interject quickly. I totally goofed on this problem. It's absolutely my fault. Um, I looked at the problem just now. I thought it was a sigma that they give you a surface charge density as if the cloud was a sphere. I was totally wrong about that. I'm terribly sorry. It's a row. They give you a row, which is a Coulombs per meter cubed, which is the charge density of the cloud. The way it's being done right now is perfect as if it was a spherical shell of charge that was the cloud, but it's a spherical ball of, of charge that is the cloud. Yeah. That's my fault. I'm terribly sorry, guys. Hey, it happens to everyone. Um, it's really nice that we did have that review there. It's good to go back to the problem, right? That changes a few things really quickly, and that's all things that is just dependent on the geometry of what we're doing. So um, the kind of general rule that we're going to have here is rather than the rho or the sigma that we had initially, we're replacing it with rho because this is in three dimensions. So therefore, the only thing that really changes is the units of what I'm putting for my charge density and what I'm going to be multiplying by, because rather than an area, I'm going to be multiplying times a volume. Make sense? Yeah, that makes okay. sense. And so um, real quick thing to go for the volume of a sphere, 4 thirds pi r cubed, correct? And so it would be very similar. This multiplied times 4 thirds pi r cubed. And here, um, I believe that it's going to be just in general the integration of e dot da like we were talking about. And in this instance, once again, it would be 4 pi r squared because this is the area that we have representing. And that is probably what helps Nick realize that this is now rho, considering that we're dealing with the Gaussian surface, and that's generally indicating the surface outside of this charged object. This is going to be pertaining to a sphere, and so that's why we have the surface area of a sphere out at some distance. So that allows this to be 4 pi 
r squared, right? Because this is just dA is equivalent to, what would that be? 8 pi r, and then a, then taking the integration of that would be equivalent to 4 pi r squared, correct? Yeah, that makes okay. sense. And so that's generally just how we're going to solve back for this. Um, and so that'll take care of the units of things like this on the top, wherever it's coulombs over meters cubed. Um, we're multiplying times the volume, so in meters cubed, so that works out quite well. And then we have the kind of general setup that we have normally, wherever we have epsilon naught being multiplied times an area. Um, I believe that the last part of the cloud problem is something about um, which way the lightning would be directed, whether it's from the cloud to the ground or from the or from the ground to the cloud. And um, I believe in the problem statement there, it does say something along the lines of that it would be going from the more densely charged object, if I'm not mistaken. Anyone have it pulled up to? I think Nick's looking at it, so. Yeah, it says, OK, since we now know how to deal with the cloud on the ground, we can find the net electric field anywhere in space. Uh, keep in mind, keeping in mind that sparks in air are more likely to form in places with bigger electric fields. Use this model to predict whether lightning will usually start at the cloud or at the ground. And our model is pretty accurate because the electric field comes from the cloud. Right? right. So because it comes from the cloud, the further away you get from the cloud, the weaker the electric field is. So the electric field is strongest closest to the cloud. So we'll say that the cloud um, is where lightning starts. OK, and so generally um, the thing that we're getting out of this is uh, whether it's implementing an equation for electric field that we had provided on our equation sheet uh, because we aren't necessarily generally going to be going through things that are you know, infinite sheets, we provide you a lot of those equations. And then for the second part, applying Gauss's law so that we can get some form of an equation for this, right? And the last part is just kind of from the problem statement. Nick just went over that. That's just asking whether it came from the cloud or the ground. And so really this is just applying Gauss's law in a few different ways so that we can kind of get quantifications. Um, the limitation of you know us doing a circuits review right now and then going into block one is that I don't necessarily have numbers, uh, but this is kind of the general setup that you would see. It's just going to be setting up Gauss's law, uh, making sure that you do have the symmetry arguments that we talked about up here earlier, um, because that's always something that they like to kind of harp on for <laughs> the entirety of the course. They want to make sure that we are following through with those. Um, but in general, does this kind of setup make sense? I know we had a little bit of a road bump there wherever we weren't sure whether it was going to be Sigma or Rho, uh, but I hope that helps to kind of clarify how you would approach the cloud problem from there, right? Yeah, that makes sense. I guess like the most confusing part, at least for me, is like how the diagram was displayed and like how it had a distance coming from the ground like to the cloud and it wanted you to like evaluate the particular distance. I guess that was where I got. Yeah, so um, once again, I think Nick has it in front of him. I believe that the reason why they provided some distance in between um, doesn't that have to do with the Gaussian surface and how far out it was going? Yeah, so the, the reason for that is because as I have indicated here, I'll just draw some red. Uh, the charge was, I think, contained to the cloud if I'm not mistaken. And so I believe that in the problem statement, they were asking for you to go out farther than that, um, maybe some distance D, maybe some portion of the distance D so that you could get an evaluation for the electric field at that distance. OK, yeah, that makes sense. OK, so I'll kind of reiterate that. Any questions about setting up Gauss's law or even anything very specific to this problem? To answer the question in the chat that says, um, if we need to use Gauss's law in a free response problem for the exam, do we still need to show, do we still need to do symmetry arguments? That's a good question. Um, I suspect, I suspect if it's a question sort of like it was on 2011, the free response on 2011, where 
you have to use Gauss's law to get the electric field between the electrodes so you can integrate that to find the voltage and then the capacitance. I suspect that won't be an actual explicit point, like saying the symmetry arguments are satisfied. But that's definitely something you're welcome to ask about during the test. Um, and the thing that I always default to is that generally whenever we are awarding points on a rubric, um, we don't pull something out of thin air, right? We look at the problem statement and we kind of stem from the problem statement. So if it says in the problem, be sure to evaluate your symmetry arguments and, you know, state them, talk about why they work for this problem or why they may not, um, then you'll generally see points associated with that. But if it's just asking you to find the capacitance and not necessarily telling you to evaluate those symmetry arguments, then it's less likely, I'll say less likely, that you'll be evaluated for that whenever you're in the test, right? All right. Any other questions that we want to go over? Um, otherwise, I think we might come back to talking about the loop rules um, briefly. And if we don't get any other suggestions, then I believe that we might be coming to an end here. Sure. If no one's opposed, we can go back to the loop rules, review those one more time for Shirkov's laws. Cool. Let's do that. Do you want me to share? OK, let me share my screen. Whoops. Um. Do, do, do. Uh, where do we want to start? Do we want to start at Shirkov's current law? Or was it mostly just the loop rules? Okay, I'm not hearing anything, so let's just... Um, What, what, what do you think, Kate? Um, okay. Let me just leave that on the screen. If anyone has any questions, please speak up. We're happy to answer them.
How many people are still here? Just out of curiosity. Not that many anymore. OK. Um. Call it a day. OK, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, cool, there's a. Confirmation there, but if anyone has anything at all, please speak up. We're more than happy to help. And then there's more officers on Monday before the test. And there's a review studio or sorry, there's a review lecture on Tuesday, the day of the test. So you guys are in the loop that there's no. There is no studio the day after the test. There's no studio on Wednesday the 14th. Other than that. Yeah, hopefully I'll get these slides emailed to you if Pat so permits. Let me stop the recording and we'll see. What we can do about that.